Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to welcome you to uh, the first breakout session on the future of urban mobility. So if you're interested in another topic, you are probably in the wrong room. You want me to speak louder? Yes. OK. All right. So again, you're in the session on the future of urban mobility. My name is Susan Shaheen. I am a professor as well as a director of the Transportation Sustainability Research Center at the University of California, Berkeley. And I am delighted to be here, acting as both a moderator and a speaker at this event. And I wanted to thank uh, John Rosant of the New Cities Foundation for inviting me to attend this event, Stefan Drasizic, and Olivia Onderdonk of the New Cities Foundation who helped us to coordinate this, as well as our wonderful panelists who I will introduce in just a moment. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the, the nuts and bolts yeah. of how this session is going to work. So what we're going to do is start with a few minutes discussion uh, regarding the problems that we face in transportation, particularly urban transportation. And then I'm going to take a moment to give you some thoughts about what I, I see in the future, particularly in the areas that I do research in. And then what we're going to do is turn to our wonderful panelists. We're going to give them each about two minutes to talk about what their role is in urban transportation. After that, each of the panelists will be uh, asked a series of questions and they will respond. We will conclude that part of the uh, discussion at about 1 p.m turn uh, the panel back over to you for approximately 10 minutes or so and have you uh, have a chance to pepper us with questions. And then the idea is, is that I will provide you with some wrap-up wisdom. So first I'd like to just introduce our panelists. I'm not going to give you bio introductions of the panelists because I think they're going to be uh, better able to provide an introduction on what their role is. Our first speaker will be Carlos Arana, who's the account executive from Google Brazil. Mary Sue Barrett is joining us. She's the CEO and president of the Chicago Metropolitan Planning Council. I, Tanya Conti uh, Cosentino, she's the zone president South America for Schneider Electric. Uh, I will also inform you that uh, Secretary uh, Jurandir is unfortunately unable to join us today, so he is not a speaker with us today. Our next speaker is Rami Roy. Uh, delighted to have you, her with us. She's a Deputy Director of UTTIPEC, uh, Delhi Development Authority in India. And our final panelist is Eduardo uh, Sacaro, Director of Sales and Business Development for Brazil uh, Bombardier Transportation. So I'm delighted to have this esteemed panel with us to explore the future of urban mobility. So now I'm gonna just start with uh, some background uh, thoughts that I've jotted down. And essentially the session description today reads as follows, is what role does mobility play in the human city? How will we move in the future city? What are the main social, economic, environmental, and technological drivers of the future of mobility? And what are some concrete examples of mobility innovation that are likely to change this field? And I believe the panel is gonna help me to address those problems. So what I wanna do is, I'm an academic, so I like a lot of statistics, and so I thought I'd actually pepper you with quite a few statistics that will set the stage for this discussion. So in 1990, 10% of the world's population lived in cities. In 2050, that will grow to 75%. And I think a key underlying theme here is how can we best prepare for the human city, the thoughtful city, the creative city that takes all human beings into account, particularly in light of the complexity and the interdisciplinary nature of transportation systems. So why is transportation something that we're thinking about as a problem in the context of urban mobility and sustainable transportation? Well, in the class I teach, I spend a lot of time talking about some trends that we have. The first is just the incredible demand for the automobile and the growing global demand that is actually rising. 
some statistics that I was able to find on a worldwide basis include 15 trillion passenger kilometers per year were driven in the year 2000 by light duty vehicles. That for that same year of 2000, 8.5 trillion ton kilometers per year were driven by medium and heavy duty trucks. So tremendous demand for auto transportation and truck transportation. Another key fact is that transportation is overwhelmingly dependent on fossil fuels. This is overwhelmingly the case in the United States uh, where I work. But statistic for you from the, uh, the year 2004 is that surface transportation worldwide was accounting for 80% of the world's primary energy demand. 83.6 million barrels per day of world oil are demanded worldwide. So again, this high level of dependency on fossil fuels is a tremendous problem. Why? Well, it's a limited resource. Second, it can result in many human health effects, negative health effects caused by air pollution and criteria pollutants. And also, there's definitely oil spills and damage to the environment. One of the worst oil spills on record actually occurred in 2010 in the Gulf Coast, and it's still an, an amazing disaster. Another point is auto use also has many negative effects on public transportation use. Once people invest in automobiles, often they're less inclined to take other choices. Walking and cycling decline with auto use, and again, as I've mentioned, there's many negative health effects. Sprawl, particularly in places like the United States, has actually required and supported the use of the automobile. So land use is a very important factor in all of this. And we must, must address the issue of climate change, which many scientists, the majority of scientists, believe is a real phenomenon. In 2004, worldwide statistic was that we were emitting approximately 4.7 gigatons of carbon dioxide from surface transportation alone, and clearly that has continued. And finally, in terms of any definition of sustainable mobility, we must consider equity considerations and how to best meet social inequities and address them head on. I think this is a key issue as we embrace technology and we need to be more inclusive of all voices. I think uh, Romy is going to address this in her comments. So now I'm going to turn to uh, my areas of research and expertise and just give you a few comments here on, in terms of what I think is really important and some trends that I'm seeing worldwide, and particularly in the U.S., that I think point to opportunities for change. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the concept of the sharing economy. Can you raise your hand if you've heard of the sharing economy? Okay. So a few of you have heard of it. It's also known as collaborative consumption. And this is a growing and new economic, economic model that emphasizes access and sharing over ownership. This is actually a topic of research that I've dedicated my entire research career to. And it's really starting to gain momentum. And I think we really should keep our eyes on this particular trend. <coughs> It appears to become more and more prevalent every day due to online connectivity, advancements in technology, the living local movement, cost consciousness, the, the lack of jobs as a result of economic decline in uh, the latter half of the, la the previous decade, as well as environmental consciousness. Some examples of the sharing economy that come from uh, the urban mobility and mobility sector include public bike sharing, car sharing, and ride sharing. And before I turn uh, the discussion over to the panel, I brought some statistics for you. Uh, some of you may be familiar with my research, but I do it on a global basis. Uh, and here's some exciting numbers. So public bike sharing, before I give you numbers, is it basically a form of public transportation that involves bicycles. So people have access to bicycles without having to own them. And the services actually provide access to those vehicles on a short-term basis that can actually support both first and last mile uh, solutions to link to public transportation, but also provide a many-mile mobility, many mobility solution. 
because these systems have become so incredibly reliable given advances in information technology, the majority of trips uh, per my research actually support commute trips, which is very impressive. As of April 2013 of this year, there are approximately 540 cities with operating public bike sharing systems, and this is growing. We just launched New York City's public bike sharing system about a week ago. It already has 6,000 bikes. And this is a tremendous trend in North America and across the world that I think we should take note of. There's approximately 462,000 bikes, shared bikes out there today, in over 22,750 stations. And again, as I mentioned, this is growing. Car sharing, which is short-term access to an automobile. How many are you familiar with the car sharing concept, like Zipcar? Okay, quite a few of you. So as of October 2012, car sharing was operating in 27 countries around the world on five continents, with an estimated 1.8 million members sharing approximately 43,550 vehicles. And this continues to be a growing trend. We're seeing more and more private sector companies entering into this space, including the car rental industry, as well as automakers. And in addition to a more traditional or classic form of car sharing, where individuals have a round trip, so they access the vehicles from a pod, and they take them out of that pod and return them to the same location. And these services are typically operated by a third-party organization. We have now seen, just since 2010, a tremendous growth in new car sharing operating business models, including one-way car sharing, systems like Car2Go. How many of you are familiar with Car2Go, which is a Daimler system? So few of you know about that. And this system is intended to be even more flexible than classic or traditional car sharing in allowing people to take trips on a one-way basis. Some people even refer to these types of services as self-driven taxis. And with the advent of autonomous vehicle technology, it is not surprising that we could see such systems in the, fu in the future, where these types of vehicles could actually drive up to the user, recharge themselves if they are based on electric vehicle technology, and park themselves. The other uh, innovation in car sharing is also uh, pretty tremendous, and this is directly linked to collaborative consumption in the peer-to-peer -peer economy. This is a car sharing model in which individuals actually place their own vehicles into a car sharing setting. This provides us with tremendous opportunity to provide car sharing, not just in urban settings with dense and reliable public transportation networks, but to actually move into the suburbs. And finally, I just want to mention ride sharing. Ride sharing is when people take individuals in their personal cars on trips. And there's a, a company that's operating in Europe called carpooling.com. And they're pretty tremendous and notable. And one of the things that I note about them is that they are actually having this total of rides per month, it's one million rides per month that this, just this one company is facilitating in Europe. And they are looking at expansion throughout the world and into North America. There's also been tremendous development in an area called ride matching. And this is where community drivers, so individuals, can actually essentially become drivers of individuals in cities. And there's been tremendous activity in this just since about August of 2012. Companies like Lyft, Sidecar, Uber, Tick and Go are spreading across the U.S. They're facing regulatory barriers and challenges because the regulators don't know what this is or how to manage it. So these are, I think, many things for us to take a look at as we look to the future of urban mobility. I think the sharing economy, collaborative consumption, and shared use mobility will definitely be part of the future of urban transportation. And with that, I want to conclude my comments and turn to our panelists to allow each of them a few minutes to introduce themselves and their role in urban transportation. Carlos? Hello, can you hear me? Hello, hello. I will speak like this yes. so you can hear me. I'm here, uh, really happy to be here. Thank you very much for 
being here with us. Uh, first of all, I work at Google Brazil as an account executive at sales team. And I would like to start with something I personally believe a lot. I think we, we, in our cities nowadays, we are still focusing too much on trying to shorten distances. And we should first think about how do we create proximities. So if you reduce the need to people, the need of people to move, you can allow them to move when they really want, they really need to. This is the first thing. I think a second important thing is to have access to information. If you want to go to A to B, you have to, to know to access this in an easy way. You have to know how, if it, it's your first day in a city, you have to know how to do it. And we, we need to give this, this kind of information. And also the other way, if I have a problem in my city, I have to have the ability of reporting it to my city in 20 seconds with my smartphone. So these two things is crucial, I think, to, to start our debate here. And I like the name, the future of urban mobility, because we are talking about cars here. I, I am sure about that. And I think we, we are starting to realize that the future of urban mobility may be is at our best, when cars were just part of the city and, and not the central thing around what everything moves here or don't move. Thank you, Carlos. Mary you. Sue? Good afternoon. I feel uh, at this session on urban mobility a little bit like we're all in a traffic jam and we have to be aggressive drivers um, to hear each other. So um, I will try to project. Um, please wave in the back if you can't hear me. So I run a non-governmental organization in Chicago called the Metropolitan Planning Council. We exist at the intersection of government and business and community leaders on success, uh, successful solutions that will help unlock growth and livability, the vibrancy of a metropolitan region. We're a tri-state metropolitan region of about 11 million people, but the city of Chicago is only three. So it's different than what we're experiencing here in Sao Paulo. What I hope to contribute to the conversation today is some practical examples. We don't have all the answers, but we're certainly experimenting with quite a bit. Um, some practical examples of how cities can try a little bit of everything. I'm a big believer in partnerships, unlocking solutions. So I hope to uh, share with you some of those ideas of employer partnerships, design and development partnerships, and financing partnerships uh, that that uh, allow cities to be experimental. Don't stop to wait for voter appro approval or political moment and of the stars aligning. Just do. Try the pilot and uh, measure the results and then communicate those through many, many mechanisms and you'll find that support builds. Look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Tanya? Hello, good afternoon to all. Are you hearing me in the end? Okay. So it's a pleasure to be here. I work for Schneider Electric, a 24 billion euros company, French by origin, but we are the global specialist of energy management and smart city. Smart city become a very important topic because cities today are fighting for jobs, for providing jobs, for attracting good people, attracting talent, uh, cultural things, and also to get more investors. Uh, and uh, to attract those, all those things, the, the city should get smarter. And to get smarter, they will become more efficient, livable, sustainable. I also believe in partnership. Technology is the great enabler. And uh, I will talk a little bit about some things that Susa explained. But to put all of those things in place and get the benefit of efficiency, you have to work with integration integrated uh, mobi urban mobility. And this is what I'm going to talk about. Thanks. Romy? Uh, good morning. Can anyone hear me at the back? Uh, I'm Romy from Delhi Development Authority. And uh, I'm a planner and urban designer by profession. And um, it's very interesting today. I wanted to focus on equity as part of the mobility discussion because um, India is one of the largest democracies in the, in the world. 
And yet, after working for five years in the Indian democracy inside the government, I often find democracy missing from decision making. And uh, it's very interesting to see that 80% or 50 to 80% of the people of Delhi actually use public transport, but they do not have a voice in decision making. Still, the decision making is driven by people who are driving cars, who are the rich and powerful. And uh, it's not just that, this trickles down to even the room in which decisions are made, where I sit and I'm probably one of the youngest looking, I'm not actually the youngest, but I'm the youngest looking person, I think, in the room. And I'm also one of the few ladies, the females in the room. And this, uh, these decades of years that have gone by with a male-dominated geriatric mode of decision making, and uh, there's this uh, small group of us who are all below 35, 40, and we are trying to change the system from inside, and I'm very proud of that. And uh, we, uh, our body, the Delhi Development Authority, has a small cell called UTPEC, which you see as part of the name. And we are responsible for approvals of all transport-related projects in the city. And we are also writing the new master plan chapter on transit-oriented development. And uh, we are hoping that with this, mostly, uh, we will change the policy direction of the city. So we are actually turning 180 degrees the direction of the growth of the city. So, uh, but uh, today I think all the experts here will talk about mobility aspects, but I would like to focus on the equity aspects of urban mobility. Thank you. Eduardo? <coughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, well, my name is Eduardo. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for the New Cities Foundation for inviting us to, to be here. And uh, I work for Bombardier uh, on the railway tr transportation segment, and our main goal is to provide, uh, let's say, the traditional as well as innovative uh, transportation means for public transportation in general, the, ranging from uh, electric buses to to high-speed trains. I mean, we can, we can do almost everything in the range of uh, public transportation, mainly by rails, but we are also active on the bus segment. Thank you. So now we're going to move into the next segment of the panel, where I'm going to ask each of our panelists a few questions. So, Carlos, can I start with you? Yep. Okay. What comes after or before infrastructure in addressing mobility problems in cities? That's a good point because we are killing, we are enduring a lot in our traffic. So uh, we, when we have a passion for a subject like this, like urban mobility, we like to talk about buses and trains and everything, but sometimes we forget to talk about human behavior. And every country is yet killing a lot in, in the traffic. It's natural, like in Sao Paulo, to, to feel safer in a car. You are not safer, but you feel safer. So you choose to use a car to go two blocks from your house. Yeah, believe me, it happens here. <laughs> because you feel safer. And that's why people prefer not to walk or cycle, for example. So I think this is, this is the first thing we have to, to think about and discuss here. Two years ago, we had a, a campaign here in Sao Paulo asking for respect for pedestrians. It was a soft campaign, like, please, respect. And it didn't, it didn't happen. We, Months later, we were on the media celebrating that the deaths dropped from 600 to 500. Wow. And we still have 5,000 people being hit by cars every year in this city. So I have a few propositions here in this subject. I think we can't just ask. We have to enforce the law, like some counters are already doing. Pedestrians are people. Let's stop talking about pedestrians. Let's talk about lives and people. Uh, we use it to have, in the past, we use it to have the right to walk on our streets and you don't have, we need this right back. We don't have this right anymore. We have one meter in a sidewalk and cars have 10, 12 meters. It happens here, for example. The third thing would be, I think the city of the future will make walking a pleasure not only safe, but a pleasure. It's something you feel invited to do. And this, the last thing is sharing vers versus separating. I think Sao Paulo can, 
can show the world. We we have this ability to show. We we didn't start yet, but we we can show the world how to share our streets. When you have to put a pedestrian or a cyclist behind a guardrail, we're definitely doing it wrong because you have to protect it. So uh, uh, sharing is having streets where everybody can go. You you don't need to to ask to cross. You don't need to wait two minutes to cross the street. And, and everything else. So I ask everybody who is here for the first time in Sao Paulo to try to cross the street here with no traffic lights, just showing your hand. Just try, don't go because I want you all <laughs> here tomorrow, right. safe. But try this. Okay, thank you. So another question for you, Carlos, is how can companies and employers start to change their role with respect to urban mobility, particularly in promoting new ways of getting around for the commute to and from work and home. Yeah, we should, we should have a lot of potential in our companies to influence human behavior because a uh, great part of the, the need of move is to go to work. So I heard about some companies here in Sao Paulo rewarding uh, their, their employees who choose to carpool. This is a great initiative. I like companies who also give technological and cultural possibility of working from home sometimes. This is also a great thing. And at Google we have some, some fun things that can be useful for you. I'm, I'm going to California to our Red headquarters this Friday. And the first thing they asked me after giving me accommodations was, do you want a bicycle to go to the office? Yes. Ah. If I say no, the second best option is a regular, reliable, safe shuttle bus service. Nobody told me about cabs or renting cars. So yes, as companies, we, we can influence this. And another good example is our SPC program, as we say that. Uh, it's self-powered commute program. If you go to work self -power, in a self-powered way, skating, cycling, walking, rollerblading, anything, you can you, you get a stamp, and in the end of the year, you have money to donate to an institution. And the last thing, here in Sao Paulo, we also give free transportation vouchers to those who choose to not having a parking space anymore. Okay, one final quick question. How critical is it that we give easy, universal, and omnipresent access about public transit? Public, okay. If you want a really public transportation, I mean public, I mean easy to find, easy to access, useful, easy to understand. So uh, Google Maps, for example, is a, is a great way to understand how to get from point A, a to point B. Uh, we have it in a lot of cities, it's the most used map service in the world. But this is just the basic. Every and each city should be putting transit, uh, public transportation information in Google Maps and every service. But this is only basic. Two years ago, we started to discuss here in Sao Paulo a new contract to the bus stops. And we now have thousands of new bus stops here in the city. These bus stops are beautiful, colorful, animated, and everything. But they don't have information about, guess what, buses. You go there, you see advertisements, you see everything, but you don't know which buses you can get over there. So uh, this is uh, uh, just one example. You know, like, I can imagine how tourists get here and, and get informed how to go <laughs> to any place here. So uh, I think every street, every bus stop, should have information about the buses and how to get to another point in the city. Thanks so much, Carlos. Enjoyed your Google perspective. <laughs> so uh, turning to Mary Sue in Chicago, can you tell us about how the Metropolitan Planning Council deploys partnerships to expand transportation choices across the metropolitan Chicago area? And then a, a, another sure. quick follow-on question okay. to that is how can other cities and regions learn from this? So I mentioned that partnerships is a big part of what we believe in. Uh, we've been around as an organization for almost 80 years and describe the types of solutions we like to affiliate ourselves with as pragmatic and innovative. What those two words together mean is that we like to be a couple steps ahead of our public sector partners, 
uh, and yet not so far ahead that nothing gets done, that it's all talk. So that pragmatic, innovative nexus uh, has led us to believe that partnerships is the key to unlocking a lot of strategies. Um, our website, which is metroplanning.org, is a great resource for a decade-long uh, experience that we've had with live near work strategies. We actually looked to the Silicon Valley area um, back in the fast growth um, time of the early 2000s and said, we don't want to be like that. We don't want to have three-hour commutes and uh, astronomical housing costs. What can we do to encourage us to rethink the development that we've got? Um, and I'm a, I'm a big believer in trying a little bit of everything. So this is about retrofitting and reinventing what you've got. So living closer to the job site. Um, more recently, we've been involved with 17 employers, including big ones like McDonald's, on a commute options pilot, offering incentives. Those little things, you'd be surprised. Um, the gifts, the incentives, the rewards do change behavior. And of course, social media makes a lot of the linking um, and matching uh, painless. So retrofitting what we've got is part of the solution, but also building new very differently. Our trans transit agencies, I suspect, are not unlike transit agencies everywhere. They're not so great as master developers. They know how to run transit systems. We're experimenting with a new bus rapid transit line. There's just one segment that's been committed to, but along this route of Ashland Avenue in Chicago, which includes some major anchor institutions, major hospitals and universities, um, the idea is to build transit nodes and villages around the major stations about every half mile spaced apart. People's initial reaction, what? You're going to take a lane of traffic out? This is a you know, congested city. And the attitude was about using our infrastructure for people first. And once we documented, and, and still in the midst of a communication campaign, to encourage people to look at how many more people were going to be able to travel in that lane on bus rapid transit versus now, um, we hope that we're going to be able to all adapt. Another thing that there's just an uproar about, it's not yet implemented, so it's all conceptual, is uh, no left turn lanes at some intersections. And people are just, you know... <laughs> can't imagine change. So you have to help people through change. Um, the, the opportunity to, to practice a lot of different strategies around these new nodes and new, new service is very exciting. And then measure, communicate results. Um, lastly, I think we have to stop so, looking for so-called pennies on the ground. Our governmental sources of funding, I realize there's differences across the different uh, uh, experiences and locations that we're from. But in the U.S. context, we cannot look to Washington, D.C. or our state capitals to fund our tremendous needs. More and more people coming to cities and regions, and so we have to unlock the emerging innovative partnerships. I'd be happy to talk during the Q&A more about some of those tools that we are putting to work. And Mary Sue, what has Chicago learned about the power of technology to inspire mobility innovation? You know, technology is... Um, there's always the early adapters and, uh, and adopters, but, but I think if we make it seamless for people to access, um, there's, there's uh, an easier embracing of it. The, a, a practical example is when our toll road system moved to a transponder-based fee collection system. You didn't have to do it. You could still use your, your coins, um, but the ratio flipped from the number of lanes dedicated to cash only to the number of lanes dedicated to the transponder. So obviously there was an incentive to, to go faster and wait less. Um, but also people could purchase these at their grocery store. Uh, made it very easy uh, first time and then it automatically reloads on, on your uh, credit card or debit, debit card. That was done several years ago. And then when the fees needed to be raised to pay for some uh, modernization and maintenance and some uh, dedicated lanes for pricing, a, some, a new technology that we haven't done yet, there was virtually no public outcry because, frankly, people didn't know how much they were paying today and they didn't feel the difference of the increase in rates. So it was easy. They saw the benefit of the investment. They trusted that the investments were going to go forward. And so technology made that angst and... Uh, you know, delay that often happens about how are we going to fund this uh, disappear. So one final quick wrap-up question. What role does attractive design play in building support for transportation investments in your city? Well, Chicago has, has not always done this well, but attractive design, safety, 
um, convenience are are too often things that you know kind of fall off the um, fall off the plate when 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 belt tightening needs to happen and and uh, cost overruns are are a concern. Don't do it because those people who are solo drivers need incentive, need to be less intimidated about how to navigate the system, um, how to uh, enjoy their commute. Obviously, if you offer Wi-Fi and you offer other amenities, um, you're becoming competitive. We have to be able to say that this carpool dedicated lane or this transit option actually is competitive with the car, and all those amenities make it so. Thank you so much, Mary Sue. So, Tanya, are you ready? <laughs> First question for you. Why is sustainable urban mobility an ambition for so many cities across the world? Yeah, I would say that it's an ambition to all cities, considering that mobility is uh, the, the biggest urban challenge and a pain point to all of us. As Carlos said, we all face, even in small city, congestions, and congestions make our life unpleasant, and we have pollution that make the life unhealth, the cost of transportation that a lot of people cannot afford because of the long distance make the, the life unequal. And we also have the unreliability of uh, the information, or transit information. So we are losing time in the traffic. We don't have nothing to do because we don't have Wi-Fi. We don't have amenities inside. So we are losing time, and time costs a lot of money to the city. Uh, and to the go not only to us, but also to the government. Mm -hmm. So, as I mentioned in my comments, our transportation systems are so complex. So with this level of complexity, where do we start? Actually, uh, it's, it should be simple, simple from the academic standpoint, <laughs> but you have to start with a vision, uh, an holistic vision, because it's not only a matter to talk about buses, trains, uh, but we are talking about bicycles, electrical vehicles, sharing, so new way of thinking, trends, behavior, uh, even electrical vehicles I can recharge by battery, but I can sell energy. So a lot of things uh, are new. So first, establishing a vision uh, with key uh, measure, metrics to measure, measurable metrics, uh, define a plan, put this plan in place. This is not that easy, and you have to start through the infrastructure itself. That's old infrastructure in most of the cities are old and overloaded. And it costs a lot of money to keep investing. Considering that today we have 50% of population living in cities, and by 2050 will be 75% of population living in large cities, uh, we cannot keep in building roads, tunnels, uh, otherwise we don't, re we don't remain space for us. So we have to add intelligence in the system. And for doing that, first we have to put collaboration, partnerships. We cannot wait for the government to do this by themselves. We can put, as Ron said, the citizen inside the loop. We have to look from the citizen perspective and try to offer, offer the efficiency of the public transportation together with additional services to them. So it's a matter to put in place collaboration between government, all spheres from municipality, regional, national, urban planners, industries, utilities, NOGs, and the citizen. So we have vision, metrics, plan, collaboration, technology. So we, have, uh, we can put, embark the technology inside and uh, when you talk about transportation, we have different types of models. And we have to integrate all those different models and all devices that we have in the city. So we have as a solution, uh, we call integrated management platform, when we can collect data from multiple devices, sensors, CCTV, existing old devices. We can collect information from traffic, different areas, traffic, pollution, weather, incidents, emergencies, events. We can also collect data and act with different departments, policy, fires, etc. So when you put all those data together, we have a tool that can enable the operator of the mobility system to take a decision in a real-time basis. So I have real-time information and I can change the flow of the traffic if some event or incident happen, 
I can also uh, help to, I would be able to better coordinate multi-agencies because as I said, I have different parts of the government, public and also private companies running several utilities that can affect the mobility. So with integrated system, I can have all those information, real-time information, this will help a lot the operator. This from seat standpoint. From citizen standpoint, could be even better because if you have a reliable real-time information, uh, geographical uh, positioning information, uh, personalized information about multimodal, so you can build your own profile and get a lot of real-time added value information through SMS, email, applications in your mobile, social media, etc. So you can define your best way to go to, to, the, to your work or to go to the stadium to see the World Cup and you can be advised by the system the better, better routes where you could park your car, if you should take the car or if you should take the velo, the bike or any other kind of transportation, how long it will take and if something bad happened, you can receive an SMS to inform you, please leave a little bit of anticipation. So, and besides that, we can add a lot of public services that would increase security and would increase quality of life to the citizens. So, so Tanya, it sounds like you're a big fan of big data. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you see that as critical to helping us measure performance as well as progress? Yeah. We cannot evolve in any topic in our private lives in the business if you don't measure. We cannot correct you cannot, what we cannot measure. So real, feasible, ritual uh, metrics are critical. We have uh, smart solutions, smart city solutions in more than 200 cities, and we can uh, propose for the government to measure energy savings because we can save more than 30% of energy in electricity with electrical vehicles and also with biofuels. We can save uh, delays traffic time. Uh, we, can say we can increase security for the streets because we, are, we improve the surveillance. So we can improve the quality of life and the city can attract more investments and more people, more tourists, etc. Thank you for your perspective. Thanks. So, uh, Rami, I'm really interested in your perspective on transportation equity. So what are the challenges in planning a city that is both accessible and equal, providing equal options to all? What, what are those challenges that we face? Um, I'll try to explain with an example which uh, might help. Like we've been talking about technology and investment in technology. Now there's this mode of transport uh, in India called the cycle rickshaw. It's a pedal rickshaw. And uh, if you combine the number of people in Delhi who commute by the pedal rickshaw and cycling, it's equal to the number of people commuting by cars. But um, for the last four years, we have been campaigning and fighting and writing policies uh, about creating cycle tracks, non-motorized transport tracks in the city, so that these modes which are already there can move safely through the city. But there's so much resistance similar to the BRT that people don't want a lane of traffic to be given to this mode. And uh, they don't realize that this is going to release, this. it's going to effectively increase their car speed if you take the slow moving vehicle out. And the investment that goes in, they will spend crores and crores, like 100 crores plus per flyover and a cycle track costs three, uh, three crores per kilometer. So it's a minuscule amount, but that investment, there's a resistance in putting it. And uh, the second thing, which a very big problem we face is that the people who, we talked a lot in the plenary session about participating and the citizen participating and the citizen becoming part of decision making. Unfortunately, in my city and country, most of these citizens cannot even read. Uh, I don't understand why all the signages in my city are in English. Most people can't even read. I don't understand these things, but anyway. So uh, how do we involve this part of the society, which actually, it's not just about reading. They don't have time to come and participate. If this person leaves his daily wage job and comes and sits in your meeting, he's not going to earn that daily wage that he uses to feed his family. 
So um, I think this is the biggest challenge today that personally we are facing in our work because I represent the government, I work inside the government and we want to reach out to the people who need these things. So when the engineers uh, and the construction industry and I don't know why there's this resistance against non-motorized transport, against public transport, uh, when we want to reach out and say that, oh, let's get the citizen voice, that voice is not there. So this is, maybe I can come up with some ideas from this forum on how we can get that voice in our room. So that will be very nice. So turning to transit-oriented development, uh, what do you think its importance is, particularly with respect to its impact on urban mobility? What role is the Todd playing? Uh, that's the policy that we are working on right now for Delhi. Unfortunately, it's one of the cities which was planned in the 70s. It was one of those cities which was formed in the same time, a little later than the United States. So it sort of looked at the states as the symbol of democracy. And almost everything, including the planning paradigm, unfortunately, was a great, great country, US, but the planning paradigm was not conducive to India. So uh, it, it, was, it all looked at segregated land uses and very long distances. And people in India are used to walking to the corner store. They are used to shopping and living above stores. So that whole culture of walking went out of planning. It was planned out of the city, you know, mixed use and transit was planned out of the city. So uh, we are actually trying to restore what was a traditional city and uh, there's, uh, I think I, I've lived and worked in China as well, there is this tendency to look towards the west. So this coin TOD is actually from the US but actually it is traditional Indian development. All our cities for centuries have been mixed use and this has a tremendous effect in reducing travel demand because if you are if your bread shop and your milk shop is right next to your house you don't have to take your car out to buy it this is the simple concept that needs to come into planning simple simple, simple planning concept simple yeah so a final quick wrap-up question for you is equality equity is really important to you so how do you think we can best go about integrating equality particularly since in India you do have people that can't can't even read how do we go about doing this um, I mean I actually really don't have the full answer to that but I think uh, it it will take good professionals I think are uh, the key and one of the things that we are struggling with is getting good professionals into the government. I don't know if this is something that other countries face, but uh, you know, like uh, salaries are very low in the government. The working conditions are very bad. Young professionals are not interested in coming and wasting their life in the government. They want the big jobs with Google and you know all the multinationals. So uh, how do we attract the youngsters? Because I I t also teach uh, in several universities and I feel that that spark is there in the youngsters and if we can attract them to come and work in the government I feel that they will make a difference so that's probably the future it's a great suggestion Rami thank you for your comments and Eduardo yep. I'd like to uh, ask you a few questions as well how can we increase mobility infrastructure while also preserving precious urban space for our people yeah oh yeah. Um. Yeah, we've been hearing about uh, different systems, uh, transportation systems, and normally uh, what we have is, is this, uh, let's say, fight between private mm -hmm. and uh, reserving space for public transportation. And uh, because at the same time that you need to reserve space for the public transportation, you cannot get rid of the cars, because otherwise, like, you take some bus corridors here in Sao Paulo where we face some huge problems of traffic and then all the commerce around the, the stores around that area were like suffering or may, many of them went bankruptcy because there was no, no movement, no trading for them anymore. And then we have to find a, a kind of a compromise between, uh, let's see, the space for the public transportation and the space for the public itself to walk, to ride a bike, or to, to drive. And then what we see as a, uh, as a solution to that is to 
I put the public transportation system out of the same way the cars share. Then, uh, and that should not turn into a car lane again. Okay? We could turn this into a, a bike lane or into improving the conditions of the, the sidewalks. As Carlos mentioned, the sidewalks in Sao Paulo are terrible. They're just awful. I, I cannot see uh, any example of a good sidewalk in Sao Paulo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, I mean, we could, instead of using, let's say, a, a lane of the, uh, an avenue or something to implement a, a, a exclusive corridor for buses or, or a BRT, we could, we could use this elevated or underground if underground is a metro, if elevated, we can have sit, uh, systems like light metro, and uh, we are implementing something here in Sao Paulo right now. That's a, a, I say a change in paradigm for, for a monorail application. That's normally it's application, applicated, applied for uh, low capacity. And we are breaking through this and having a very, say, heavy, capacity uh, monorail installed in, in the east part of the city right now. Okay. Then, and under the monorail where there used to be a, a division between the, the two sides of the avenue, uh, there will be a lot of uh, trees being planted and also they will implement uh, bike lanes with uh, bike parking areas at the st all stations so that they can integrate the the public transportation, the mass transit system, with some different means of reaching that mean. Because the, I mean, the the the, the main, uh, let's say, characteristic of a trunk system, like a metro line or a, a BRT, is that uh, it has a high capacity but very low flexibility, and there is no capillarity on the on the on the metro line. Okay, you have to get access to the metro to, to then you have you can have a fast trip from one point to the other but the the point that they connect is very is very fixed I mean you cannot like, move around <laughs> with the metro okay right. and then uh, I mean the, the proposal of better use of the space is that to, to move the the public transportation system underground or overhead and have the space that is uh, let's say, released with that uh, use of new system, applied to, for the public, mainly for pedestrians and, and bike riders. Right. And uh, just a final question. How is technology contributing to improving ur urban mobility in a mega city like Sao Paulo? Yeah, the, uh, I mentioned the example of uh, the monorail. I mean, the, before that, we have the example of, let's say, enhancing the application of uh, on existing technology like buses, then we, we always had buses, then we had the bigger buses, and then we had the even bigger buses, and then we had uh, bigger buses into an uh, exclusive corridor. And then that was uh, an evolution of the technology, um, but more on the application, not on the, on the bus technology. There is no, no big change on the bus technology by that. Uh, I mentioned the monorail. Monorail was uh, normally used for like say amusement parks or, or some short distance, some connections like having Vegas for connection between resorts. Uh, and now we are established the first application for a heavy transit uh, uh, system. We, our, uh, say the, the system is sized to transport 40,000 PPHPD, I mean people per hour mm -hmm. at, the, at peak hours, meaning that it's, it's, uh, it's almost a metro capacity, metro works at 60,000, 70,000 tops, and then we are working at 40,000 with the monorail that was never used like that. And this is a breakthrough on, the, on this technology. Uh, I've been just to the EYTP last week, and uh, the EYTP is the International Union for Public Transportation, and uh, say the main attraction at the event were the electric buses. And we are not now talking anymore electric buses like trolley buses we have here, but uh, are all battery fed, uh, and you can recharge the buses at different stations. Uh, 
we have just a system that uh, you can recharge the battery by induction, electromagnetic field instead of uh, connecting. You don't have a wire, you don't have a plug, you don't have nothing. You just stop the bus over a recharging station and by induction, mm -hmm. electromagnetic induction, you can charge the battery. And then you can do this along the way and then the lifetime of the battery is much more, uh, it's much longer than, than a normal battery. Then <coughs> there are some uh, some new developments on electric buses and it looks like electric buses will be the, the trend for the, the future and it will not demand like this all the overhead lines we have like we have in the uh, downtown in Sao Paulo and it will, and we can also by using the batteries we can also save a lot of energy because you can regenerate energy when you break the bus there is a lot of uh, uh, development on this on these areas right now and then the, I think this this is something that we will be seeing shortly in Brazil. It's uh, kind of widespread in Europe right now, but uh, it will be coming back, uh, coming here to Brazil very soon, I think. Great, thank you. Well, thank you all panelists uh, for participating in the question and answer component. Uh, now we're gonna turn it over to the audience. And what would be wonderful, I think, is if we do have a mobile, uh, Thank you. Good, because you will find that when you go to speak, you do need to elevate your voice. <laughs> we are competing for voice time. So please give us your name and your organization, and then follow with your question. Oh, start. Okay. Hi. My name is Daniel. Um, I'm just a simple question. We talked a lot about infrastructure, efficiency, but my question is more about the human. Let's say in 10 years, why people are leaving their homes? For what reason? Why do you use transportation? Because if they change the form of transportation, if they have more, you know, regional, more decentralized, more closer to their flats, perhaps don't even need this transportation, the efficiency of the transportation. We have decentralization of education, of, trans, uh, of delivery, of production. So. What, what's your idea? Why are people leaving their homes? For what reason are they interacting with the city? For all of you. <laughs> Does someone want to start? Well, uh, yeah, I can start. Uh, let's see, we, of course, we have uh, every day we are increasing the, let's say, or we are decreasing the need for, for commuting. But uh, anyway, as uh, Mayor Haddad mentioned during his speech, uh, the production the science, scientific production, the cultural production, comes from the, the contact, the direct contact between people. Okay, and then of course you can work at home. I can work at home. I have my my PC. I can work at home, no problem. But uh, I have to meet customers. I have to to go to meetings internally of to the company. Then I need to commute anyway. Although this can be a change in the future. You can put a video conference equipment in each home, and then you can you can work directly from home anywhere. But there is still a lot of need for 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 transportation means, and the way the city is today, we cannot uh, keep increasing the fleet, the private car fleet as we are, and for sure we don't have uh, conditions to increase the infrastructure to cope with that uh, increase in traffic. Okay then we have to invest in transportation, public transportation solutions, and we have to invest in long-term public transportation solutions. Not something that will solve the problem just for the next week, but for 10, 15 years at least. Okay, Mary Sue, did you have something you wanted to add? Well, from the opening plenary, I jotted down this concept of commute to connect, not to compute. Um, so if it's solitary work, Obviously, you've got options to stay put. Um, but increasingly, and we're seeing this as a, um, a trend, a counter trend of companies that have, had chosen in the 70s, 80s, and 90s to move their corporate campuses out to greenfield sites for pastoral landscape um, are finding that their new age, new economy, younger workers refuse to work in those settings. They will not do the solo driving. They do not want to be in that isolated setting where you have to get in the car to go somewhere place for lunch. And so they are, some of them are shedding those campuses, others are keeping them, but their growth is in downtown in the loop where you've got advertising agencies, 
and accounting firms and legal and so forth, and the connections, the synergy that happens even within an office. So I think that that need for creative connections is only growing, and our transportation has to facilitate that, has to be adaptive. Great, thank you. Carlos, final comment on this question? Yeah, I love it. I love your question, and just a quick comment. The original reason of having cities was to live together, I and mean, we don't live together anymore. We live in our cars, closed cars with closed windows. And if you, if you think urban mobility, trying to allocate each means of transportation in designed spaces, in special lanes, you are separating, you are not sharing, you are not integrating, you are not living together. Okay, thank you. Another question? Uh, we need, um, we have a gentleman in the front, I think. It, is it possible to? Thank you. And then we'll come back. My name is uh, Leslie Galvani Brown. I work for Greenpeace. And uh, thank you so much for your presentations. I'm very encouraged by all the brain power we have that gives me hope for the future. And I do think we need technolo technological solutions, we need cultural solutions, and above all, I think the issue of transportation is a democratic issue in the big cities. And I'm encouraged by your talk as well. I just wanted to ask a question about Sao Paulo specifically. One of the biggest problems in Sao Paulo is that there, is, there are too many cars and the public's uh, transport system is currently insufficient. What we basically want to do is get people out of those cars and go by transportation in a different way, i.e. walking, biking, and so forth. And as you alluded to, what the prop why do people go by car today? It's about perceived safety, it's about convenience, and it's also about status simple, right? What we're seeing now, there's a lot of uh, new people work moving into the C and D classes, which means a lot more people become more affluent, they can buy more cars. And cars is also a status symbol. And I, for one, cannot blame people for wanting a car when they finally can afford one. And all this is very much stimulated by Dilma's um, approach to grow the GDP by lowering the taxes for cars on cars, for people to be able to buy more cars to increase the consumption. So that is kind of the crunch I'm seeing now. So many more people are buying cars, particularly urban living people, while at the same time we need to get them out of the cars. And I'm at loss here. How do we address this crunch when you see this thing coming from the top and at the same time we want to address it? And the final comment is that, uh, talking about what Ashwin Mahes mentioned in the plenary session about leadership, shared leadership. If we have shared transport, shouldn't we also have shared leadership for developing that transport, which is definitely not the case now. Thanks. Great questions. I think uh, Eduardo, yeah. you wanted to start, yeah, I, and then Tanya. Yeah, I would. Uh, <coughs> sorry, I would add just one comment there. I mean, we are, of course, I said we are increasing our fleet by far more than our infrastructure can cope with. But the problem is that we, uh, if you compare the motorization index of São Paulo, that's the most motorized city in the country, with uh, cities in Europe like Barcelona, for instance, we are like uh, maybe a half half rate of uh, Barcelona right now. While, but they, uh, although they have cars, all of them, they use public transportation because they have public transportation that is safe, is reliable, is punctual, and of course, they, they, they want to trade the comfort of being inside a car but locked in a traffic jam by being sure that they will reach their destiny on due time instead of São Paulo is like that. If you go by car, you never know what time you're going to reach the place. <laughs> Tanya? Yeah, São Paulo is a huge city in terms of in the dimension. And uh, it, I, I totally agree with Eduardo. The, 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 the transportation, public transportation is insufficient, inefficient, and reliable. So we really need strong investment in improvement the quality of transportation. Uh, instead of keeping building new new lanes or, or, or sometimes it's not enough without planning is not enough so we really need planning that would involve different members of the society to discuss not from something top down uh, but we cannot stop the the growth of population or the consumption of the classes E and D because we can also ask them to stop to consume energy and water this is not fair so what we have to do is to first develop the uh, awareness of consumption. This is something that you guys can help people to consume with better awareness, uh, avoiding wasting. But on the other hand, we have to improve the quality of transportation. Thank you. So a uh, question uh, for the gentleman in the, in the blue shirt, second row. 
Hazem Galal, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, so far, we've been hearing a lot of things or solutions that relate to the existing paradigm of mobility. And I wanted to hear some of your thoughts about trying to design our cities in different ways rather than the hub and spoke model in ways where we have more compact neighborhoods, more, uh, less journeys rather than trying to cope with the demand you know, by putting in more mobility solutions, how to actually reduce the journeys through a more integrated design. I'm going to link the last two questions a little bit in response to that. The democratization of the planning process, I think, is part of the answer because people have great ideas about how their life has evolved and how our systems have not. Um, right now, we are very dependent on an, a public meeting, which the professional meeting attenders come to, and it often is confrontational, either about a proposed development or proposed infrastructure. If we just open up the process and using social media tools, a lot of good ideas about what people desire for their neighborhood comes forth. I know the placemaking movement has been um, very instructive for us as far as bringing programming to public spaces that are dead and vacant right now. They're, they're underutilized plazas and parks and so forth. That can become the hub of a community that can revitalize itself. It needs transit, it needs employment, it needs quality housing. Uh, but those assets of gathering spaces are often overlooked in a debate about transportation, but that becomes, it, 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 it is the heart of a community. And if you pay attention to those, um, those intangibles that draw people to love where they live first and then invite people to participate in the process, then I think we'll get much different ideas. And Rami, I believe you wanted to yeah, ask um, a question. This is a very pertinent question, I think, in every city. Uh, I'll just take the India example in this. We're trying, to, we're trying to do exactly that with our TOD policy. But there is very interesting the intricacies of that. So when we talk about urban design as an inducer of reducing travel demand, it's, most people don't understand this at all. But like many cities like, um, I don't know about Sao Paulo, but Delhi is very unsafe for women. And uh, there are a lot of uh, urban design issues, like there are big boundary walls and uh, you know, the streets are dark at night. So a woman, which is 50% of your public transport user, is not safe on the street after 7 o'clock. So if she's not safe, how are you going to ever have a modal shift? So, uh, so we are introducing forcibly things like removing boundary walls, uh, adding street lighting, creating mixed use, creating active frontages on streets, uh, and having the neighborhood model where everything is shared, you know, so people are not always going down to a basement parking, making people use things like shared parking in neighborhoods, so you're forced to walk to your even your parking lot. So uh, these things are very important in a modal shift measure towards reducing travel demand and uh, public transport induction. But this is absolutely not acknowledged in most uh, mobility discussions and transport issues. Hopefully in our policy it will be. Okay, so uh, I know there's many questions, but it's uh, just a few minutes before wrap-up time. So what I'm going to do is uh, take moderator privilege and just uh, spend a few minutes with you, uh, giving you some common themes that have come out of this session. And I'm sure the speakers would be willing to address other comments after the panel ends. So some of the common themes that we heard here today included the importance of technology. Numerous speakers talked about the role of data, information technology, and alternative fuels as being absolutely critical to the future. We also heard quite a bit about partnerships and the role of cities as examples for other cities. We also heard about the importance of careful, thoughtful, and creative planning around transit-oriented development and urban space, and that we need to create a very comprehensive and inclusive planning process to take all voices into consideration. And also, we heard about the importance of not just space for public transit vehicles and for automobiles, but the importance of space for public transit, cycling, and walking. And what I would like to just add and conclude with is that I really think we need to think about the city as the platform for the future. 
because so many people are going to be living in cities in 2050. As I mentioned earlier and others have mentioned, 75% of the world's population will be living in cities in 2050. So what about the role of cities as social platforms, the role of neighborhoods as social platforms, and how can we influence this process and infuse this process with creativity, with artists, with architects, with all sorts of interdisciplinary backgrounds to help us address these very complex issues as we move forward. And I'd like to just conclude with a thought from William Gibson, a famous sci-fi writer, who said that the future is here already. It's just not evenly distributed yet. And I really think we need to think about that as we move forward, that a lot of the solutions are here, but we need to distribute them across all cities and across to all citizens of those cities. And with that, I'd like to thank our wonderful esteemed panel with a round of applause. Thank you very much.